the news is spreading more so now it's almost good for uh, 150 guys if more order will come we will cook for them definitely because of the hurricane fiona everybody is uh, starving for a shelter and uh, food so what we can we just uh, get a idea like uh, how we can help the community at least like from the basic basic level we are so happy to uh, do this and we will be continuing this until we make sure that each and every one are okay with at least with food <coughs> at least with food so this is the uh, traditional uh, food in our pro uh, province in india back to india yeah and it's the simplest and easiest recipe to make and it's healthy too what's the recipe called uh, it's green gram yeah. green gram curry we were in a situation a uh, problem where we didn't get much uh, enough uh, facilities and utensils to cook the food and all of a sudden when we inform uh, mr ashwell he discussed with the management of the governor's pub and they were very happy to offer us uh, their facilities and uh, we have to thank them also on this uh, moment. It's always important to help your community, especially when we're in a situation where we can help. So it, it only makes sense for us to help and, and any situation like this, it's just good, it feels good. So we have been uh, like consuming uh, all this uh, bread, jam and everything for the past uh, for five days. So all these people, what they're doing is great service. So we are really thankful for whatever they're providing us with. Yes. If you want to eat what the Guru is teaching you, then you have to go and do the steps needed. If you have all of the ingredients lying in front of you, it doesn't make a meal. The ingredients can only do so much. You still have to cut them, chop them, heat them, put them all together in the right way, put them on a plate and pick them up and eat them. Now, is that hukum or is that effort? Or are they linked? Are they essentially part of the same thing? The hukum requires you to do some things. Where Gurbani talks about get up and do your effort, that's part of the system. So what you do is you do your effort. The outcome is not in your control. The effort is in your control. The outcome is not in your control. So I'm, I'm Hari Jout Singh and I've been helping with the audio stories of Sikhnet, the or now the animated stories of Sikhnet for some time. And this is Govinder Singh. He's been helping more recently. And, and the most recent thing that we've created is the story of the ancient one. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And first of all, what was your uh, your general impression of this story? I think you'd heard it as a kid before. Right. I'd been to Ambarsar many times before, and I'd visited Santokhsar uh, two or three times before. And I think the initial time I visited was I, I was taken there when I was younger. And I, I would visit there repeatedly simply because it was kind of abandoned, neglected. And there was a lot of mystery that was pulling me to the place as to, you know, what is this place? What is its actual history? And all you really get is a summarized kind of history of the place outside of the Gordara um, that doesn't really go into much detail. And so it was always kind of like a, an intention of mine that I would do deeper research about it and, you know, make a change about this. I mean, congratulations to you as being like a, a, a young kid at the time and thinking, I'm going to research this later at some point. I mean, because, yes, it's it's so when I look at that story, I heard a, a couple of different versions of the story and I wrote a script for this story like several years ago. But then we discovered, you know, it's actually written in the Suresh Prakash Granth, which is a very comprehensive, like, you know, history of all 10 gurus. And now we had a text that we could actually base the script off of rather than just kind of the stories that I heard. It's actually not as different as I would have thought, the original to, to what we came up with. But um, the significance of the story is incredible to me because it's this person had been waiting. He'd been told that someday uh, in the future in Kal Yug, there will be a person in Guru Arjan who will incarnate and you have to talk with him and he will give you all the wisdom you need and he will liberate you. 
So the, the idea that somebody's been waiting for thousands could be 6,000 years, could be 10,000 years, who knows? The, the idea that, that in one day the Guru would liberate this person, that's just a day in the life of the Guru Arjan. It just emphasizes how deep is Sikh history, how supremely important is our history, is our teachings, and highlights if he can liberate somebody in one day who's been waiting all these thousands of years, how, what about everything else he said? That's one Shabbat that he could be explaining to that person. And he's written hundreds of Shabbat. So it's, it, it, the idea is to convey these stories to, to the younger generation. And that significance is inherently imparted by the fact uh, that this person had been waiting for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that brings us into the kind of the translation here where the the work that we're working from is the Suresh Prakash Grant. And it's, it was, there's an old Braj Basha um, version, the original version from the 1800s. And then Ajit Singh Olak had been the one to translate it into more modern Punjabi, right? And that's what we were working on with. Yeah. So we, we've got the Braj Basha text, which is, you know, the traditional court language or uh, the language of the poetics that are that are happening within the uh, 17th to 18th century uh, to even the 19th century uh, in classical Indian courts. Um, and so Kavi Sintok Singh wrote the history of the Gurus in that language. And so there we were struggling away, um, translating both the original Pun Punjabi Dika, the translation, as well as the uh, Braj Basha itself. And of course, we had to do that because the Dika doesn't actually necessarily translate everything, which is, you know, partially to do with the politics of translation and, and you know, Sikhi and its reformation and all of these things. So we had to sit there and we had to kind of go through that process of um, translating the Braj uh, correctly so that we could extrapolate the, the best details we could from, from the Suraj Prakash narrative for our story. So, yeah. Yeah, and that was no small work. That, that that was like it took a lot of concentration to get that part done. Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is to kind of show there's a lot of work that goes behind. It's it's like it's stories for kids. At the same time, we're making a translation. This is available in English probably for the first time for the English world, where mm -hmm. you can. It's out there. Like there's you know somebody would have said a little bit of the story in a forum somewhere, and people have kind of heard this on the street, but. The actual translation of this text available in English, I believe this is the first time. So that's another kind of exciting part about this. This is behind the scenes work just to create the audio for the animation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it also adds or it also plays into the visuals as well and in the way that we, you know, direct that process of, of um, you know, our animators themselves are creative people and they, they do amazing work. But, um, you know, as we're going through that process, as we're translating, uh, we're not just translating, we're also producing the visuals, we're, we're gaining an awareness, a concept of the visuals. And it's a very tough process sometimes sitting down thinking about, wait, you know, just how was this happening? How was the Guru doing this? Or how were the Sangat reacting to this? How do we portray that? Um, it's, it's a beautiful, but sometimes frustrating process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there was there's a few, I mean, we don't really have time to go all, all the different little things that we put into this, but there was like, there's, it's a vision, you know, we, we pick out the, the specifically, we want to highlight parts of the translation, specifically, we, we have like our vision of how that would look like in animation, and putting it all together. Um, yeah, but it but it's fun in the end, even if it is cumbersome, it's still it's still a fun process. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. one part of the story that didn't quite make it in the animation because it's just like there's there's so many layers to the text that you can't put everything in it's just too much and i and i try to put in different layers but one thing that didn't quite make it in is after the yogi meets uh the guru the guru requests him to stay around for some time and give darshan to the sangat and the guru says this will increase the faith of of the sangat and the yogi has he's been waiting all these thousands of years and he's and he's trying to he finds a way to get out of this request. And so it's very interesting because the guru requests him to stay and the guru still gets kind of what he wants anyways, because the guru wants people to have Sangha to have his darshan. So instead of just kind of liberating him in the moment, guru sends Baba Buddha Ji to meditate with him and show him the path of liberation through meditation. 
And because this took a little bit of time for them to do that meditation and go into Samadhi together, the Sangha the crowded around and everybody did have his darshan anyways. So it was kind of, it was, it was, it was a cool interaction to see that the yogi in a way turned down the Guru's request, but the Guru still got what he wanted anyways. And the Guru fulfilled his desire to, because he said, Baba would just go and fulfill him anyways. Right. So that was, that was a cool little side thing that, that it just, it says something about the dynamic. It, and, it's, um, it's very poetic. It reminds me of the Shabad, Melisanta Jana Vardapagi Payo, right? There's, there's so much caked into what this story is. Because, you know, there the yogi is sitting there for however many thousands of years he's sitting there, um, waiting for the darshan of the guru so that he can receive liberation. Uh, he has this long, complex conversation with Guru Arjun, only for Baba Buddha Ji to then actually be the one who imparts the instruction of Naam, the dhrita of Naam, to, to him, um, which in some sense is just profound because it shows you know, the the nature of what Gurmat is. The Guru himself is a Gurmukh, just like Baba Buddha Ji. And it's something that we forget, but Bhai Gurdas reminds us of that. That highest enlightened state is the state of the Gurmukh, the one who has realized the Naam, the one who's providing us with Naam, which in itself parallels with how the Gurdev of the Panch Bihari today, when we receive the initiation of Khande Ki Bal, is the one who's responsible to giving us uh, the Dreta of Naam and uh, the Mool Mantir, the Gur Mantir, and directing us through that same process. It's a congregation welfare, the Sangata involved. It's you know, There's so many parallels there that that that's what makes this such a beautiful thing to focus on. There's there's another line from Gurmukhi it reminded me of, from the Guru Granth Sahib it reminds me of, and I looked it up and it's Guru Sikh, Sikh Guru Ha Eko Guru Ubades Chalai, which means that the Sikh is the Guru, the Guru mm. is the Sikh, and together they do the same work of forwarding the Guru's teachings. So okay. you see exactly Gurbani in this story, that the Sikh of the Guru is, in this case, is Baba Buddha, and he is, in this, for all intents and purposes, all intents and purposes, he is the Guru. He's implying, he's imparting the Guru's teachings, and it's, he's obviously, he's doing it by the direct, like, uh, permission of, of the Guru himself, but it, it does, it emphasizes that yeah. point. And he, he, what's interesting about it as well is he's probably the only one in the court at the time for whatever reason, but he is the contemporary of Guru Nanak, that he himself received Nam from Guru Nanak. Mm -hmm. uh, which, again, there's there's the layers of symbology, the layers of beauty there. And, and it also shows our responsibility as Gurmukhs when individuals come to us and they ask for directive and direction that because we, the Khalsa, the living Guru in this age, the living manifestation of the Guru's physical body, something that we've covered in our stories before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Guru Granth Sahib is uh, the 12th manifestation, but the Khalsa is the 11th manifestation of the Guru. The Sarblu Granth provides detail for that. But um, yeah, with, with that physical manifestation of the Guru, we're there to, to provide the, the vehicle of the teaching. Guru's court. We're here to create the Guru's court. We are the courtiers. Right. And our job is to create the court. As, as Guru not... says, Khalsa Mira Sadhguru Pura, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there we go. Yeah. So, yes, on one hand, this is a, a story for kids and it's, it's it'll be an animation. And they like to, a lot of these kids, they like to rewatch these things and kind of some of these layers of significance, they're just kind of imparted in them. And this is kind of what, what creates, in my mind, it creates a culture, it creates a Guru culture where where you, there is wisdom imparted into people in their in their youth and this is something that i i really feel strongly about that that we don't have to see them as just like they don't understand anything so we just tell them just whatever uh you talk to them like they're adults but you talk to them the way they can understand it doesn't mean you can't give deep messages and this also is a story for adults obviously as well even if it's geared for kids so um anyways it's it's that that's what I like to do with all the stories is make them compatible for both generations, and um, yeah, it it was it's it's a happy seva to do. And so through this, we hope that you know an understanding, a relationship can be rebuilt or reforged with Santok Sar Sahib, one of one of the five sarovars of Amritsar that Guru Hargobind Maharaj gave us the hukum that 
every good sick must fulfill this 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 bhajan, this hukam of mine that you must you know take take ishnan in each and every one of the surahs to to gain the qualities that are embedded there. Santoksar is the first surah of Amritsar, the place where we can gain um, the experience, the gnosis, the the mysticism of contentment. And that contentment that arises through Nam, that's what's been instilled in that place. The conversations that arose from Guru Arjan to the yogi and from Baba Buddhaji to the yogi are embedded in the vibration of that Amrit, of that Sarovar that, that exists there. When we bathe there, that is imbibed in within us. So, um, you know. I just realized I lived in Amritsar for so many years. And though I did have Ishnan at Santoks at one time, <laughs> and and Amritsar many many times, I didn't know this that, that we should all do all five. Yeah. And there's three other sarovars that I haven't gone to yet, and I have to go. <laughs> in in my previous, I just came back from India a couple of months back, um, and I accidentally ended up doing all five, which was you know by sheer coincidence because it is a blessing then. It is. Uh, Santoksar and Amritsar obviously separate from each other but Bibiksar and Kolsar and sorry um Kolsar and Amritsar are next to each other Santoksar yeah. is further away and then the other two uh or other three uh Bibiksar and Ramsar you have yeah, yeah, the other yeah. two yeah the other two there's another one in between as well which is like a subset over but you know the other two um are right next to each other so um you know it was a it was a win for win uh, kind of thing. No, the reason why I said three actually is because Baba Baba Deep Singh's shrine is there, where his uh, head was actually beheaded. You know, mm -hmm. where he placed his head down is in the Parkarma, but where he actually attained the shiddhi of his body mm -hmm. uh, is uh, at the Gordara Baba, uh, Baba Deep Singh. And that's Which is near Baba Ekser and Ramsar. Yeah, it's linked to those Gordara. Okay. So I took my brother and my, my father with me. Uh, we put our shoes off at Baba Deep Singh's Gordara. But then we were walking <laughs> to Ramsar and to okay. the big So by out. chance, by Guru's blessing, you completed the five sarovaras. <laughs> by Baba Deep Singh's okay. blessing. <laughs> and this is another way in which this is a message for the adults too. Now we know we all have to do this. Right. 100%. 100%. And you know, so the, the, with the animation, uh, we hope that the children enjoying this can forward the culture of learning and growing in, in Gurusiki. History is super important. Stories are very important for our culture. I say when you have stories and when you have songs you can have a strong culture so that's what we're trying to do with these stories so with that we we hope that uh it goes over well and we hope that everybody can can watch this and spread it amongst uh, if if you feel it worthy we present it to you and please do watch it and spread it amongst your family thank you I'm sure all of us have experienced that moment when you're walking along in a shopping center, immersed in your own thoughts. And as you walk past a shop front window, you fleetingly see someone who looks just like you. They have the same clothes, the same hairstyle, and when you look at them, they even have the same eyes staring straight back at you. They are shockingly familiar because they are you. But even when you realize that you're simply looking at a reflection, there's a part of you that doesn't entirely accept this. This is because our reflections are only a mirror image of our true selves. Our true selves are captured in a photograph. That's how we actually look. And yet, as research has shown, most of us prefer looking at our mirror image. We like it simply because it is more familiar to us. And that is important. We are more comfortable with things that are more familiar to us, even though they may not be accurate or real. So this is just part of a more complex issue. The way that we see ourselves, our image, rarely correlates with how others see us. More specifically, how we see ourselves in our minds, our personal identities, are only ever partially captured in our external identities, how the rest of the world sees us. And this is important, 
because identity confers power, access, and credibility. On a practical level, in the United States, identity theft deprived the US economy of $41 billion annually. Extroverted personalities such as the Kardashians, whether you love them or hate them, have managed to turn their identities into brands. So when we vote for a politician, or when we buy a celebrity-endorsed product, we are endorsing their identity. Why? Because we identify with them and place our trust in them. So our, it's no surprise then that we spend so much of our time thinking about who we are and who we would like to be. And yet, remarkably, few of us have an accurate conception of our own identities. We might think that we are being perceived in a certain way, or believe that our actions are shaping the views of others. But we cannot really measure these effects. And this importantly suggests that our identities are not entirely within our control. Another way of thinking about this is the number of automatic associations we make when we meet someone. For example, you are now looking at me. And in an instant, you've noted the color of my skin, my accent, and hopefully the fabulous shoes that I'm wearing, which, for the record, is golden brown, British Australian with a hint of Punjabi, and Kurt Geiger. So these attributes um, contribute to a multitude of associations within our minds, and they are derived from our personal experiences. Hence why politics, advertising, and social media are such powerful drivers of our thinking. Even more surprising is that we rarely actively engage these ideas. Instead, they simply express themselves as superficial likes or dislikes. In light of the momentous events of 2016, I've begun to think more deeply about what do others see when they look at me, and what are the core determinants of my identity? Now, when I ask my friends what defines me, they often say that it's my interminable sarcasm, or my insatiable love of shoes, or my penchant for chocolate. But what shapes the way a lot of people look at me concerns this braid that runs down the middle of my back. My hair is long simply because I've never cut it. And the reason for that is also straightforward. It's because I'm a Sikh. For those of you not familiar with Sikhism, it's one of the world's youngest major religions. With its origins in northern Punjab in the 15th century, a province of India, it is a religion that focuses on a single god that is timeless, shapeless, and invisible. Therefore, the central practices of the religion are to build discipline, to cultivate honesty, and to engender a sense of service to one's community. It may surprise you to know that it is the fifth largest religion in the world. One key practice of the faith is not to cut your hair. There are three main reasons for this. First, Sikhs believe that people were created as they were meant to be, and therefore by not cutting our hair, we are respecting our bodies. Second, Sikhs want to be identified. We want to be known as people who will help you in situations, and our turbans and long hair instantly distinguish us from those around us. And third, Sikhs believe that by not cutting your hair, similar to not drinking alcohol, which is another Sikh practice, we are cultivating discipline and living a more principled way of life. Ironically, I was born bald. <laughs> but I quickly caught up and before long had a full head of hair. Now, until I started school, I never realized that this length of hair was at all unusual. At school, I quickly became known as the girl with the long hair. A catchy moniker, but not quite in the same league as a dragon tattoo, which could have led to a book deal or a Hollywood movie. Another byproduct of my distinctiveness were the questions. They've started when I was six and have never really stopped since. How long is your hair? How long does it take to wash? Have you ever cut it? And my all-time favorite, have you ever sat on it? Now, since I can see you're all wondering, I'm going to give you some answers. It takes 20 minutes to wash, but sometimes hours to dry. I've never, ever cut it. And of course, I've sat on it. In fact, hardly a day goes by where I don't sit on my hair, causing my head to jolt back violently as I scream, 
follicles. <laughs> and the responses to my hair have been fascinating. Most of my friends think that it's beautiful. And many of the teachers at my school were incredibly supportive. This is important because I attended a non-denominational uniting church school. And yet, I was elected as head prefect, conducted assemblies, and did Bible readings. And not one person throughout my entire schooling ever questioned the validity of me performing these duties. Some people, however, have found my hair confronting. One incident that is etched firmly into my memory happened when I was at a school camp, age 10. As I was walking along a bush trail, a girl behind me grabbed my braid. And as I turned around to look at her straight in the eyes, she just looked back and said, ew, freak. I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach and lost something in the process. It came as a shock to be called a freak, but what made it painful was that I didn't know this girl. In fact, I'd hardly ever spoken to her. All she knew about me was that I had long hair. Over my life, there have been many experiences like this, which have made me want to chop it all off. As a young girl, I would often stare into the mirror and fantasize about having a short, sophisticated bob or wavy shoulder-length tresses. I would dream about just being a girl rather than the girl with long hair. And one day, I got my opportunity. I was standing in, the, in my bathroom brushing my hair. My mum walked in and just looked at me and said, you don't have to keep it, you know. You've now reached an age where you can make your own decisions, and if you want to cut it, you can. As a teenager, I had begun to realize that my religion, my identity, and the physical expression of these ideas were my choices. And in an instant, I could now change my defining characteristic. I could cut my hair. But despite this, I just couldn't bring myself to cut it. Because I want to be known as a person who will help you if you're ever in need. I want to be seen as a person who's on a journey to building discipline and becoming more honest. With adolescence came the additional peer pressure of drinking alcohol. Now, I'm Australian, and Australians love to drink. In fact, in Australia, drinking is more popular than swimming and probably more fundamental to Australian culture. <laughs> Hence the common Aussie phrase of having a drink whilst getting in the drink. But my parents, ever concerned, primed me with a host of excuses, concerned that I wouldn't have the confidence to give an honest answer. Just tell them that you're driving, or tell them that you've already had enough to drink. But by this stage, I was beyond pretending. So as I finished my school, I began to tell people, I don't drink, and I don't cut my hair, but also demanded to be treated as an equal. Equality is a word that is used in so many different settings that it hardly carries any useful meaning. And yet it still represents a vitally important concept. Equality is about allowing individuals the opportunities to make the most of their lives and their talents. It's about recognizing that each individual is complex and capable of the entire breadth of human emotion. I want my quirks and my intricacies to be understood and fully appreciated. I want to be seen as a nuanced young woman whose experiences and potential speak to far more than the color of my skin or the length of my hair. In his 1984 novel, George Orwell warns of a world where every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed with exactly one word and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Every year, fewer and fewer words and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. Sure, I'm a Sikh, and I absolutely have very long hair, but it's not my defining characteristic, because I'm also sassy, love fashion, and would gladly live in enormous Louis Vuitton heels. So how did long hair change my life? Well, as I walk around Oxford, I see people with tattoos, crazy colored hair, and punk rock outfits, and that's just the Oxford professors. But seriously, 
I see people who want to express their identities and their sexualities and be understood and appreciated for that. My long hair taught me that for some, this struggle is born out in public displays of who they are, whilst for others, it's a private journey. Both are equally valid and warrant respect. Each of us is coming to terms with our own distinctiveness. And in doing this, we have to love who we are, but when someone else shows us who they are, we must embrace and accept them for who they are. We are all human. We just need to be more humane. Thank you.